yeah, first of all, I'd like to, organ uh, to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, uh, seminar, and I'm very thankful for uh, allowing me uh, to speak and inviting me. I was born uh, in a poor uh, Muscovian uh, suburb, so for me this is a huge step up. But um, I will also ask you to excuse me for reading off the screen today because I have a lot of material to present and if I just start speaking off the bat, we will never end. Um, I will try to make it concise and short, but please, Jake, if you feel that I'm uh, violating the schedule, just give me a heads up. Thank you. Well, um, my topic, my talk today is uh, a very uh, sort of critical one, and I deliberately chose the... Um, uh, I deliberately formulated this uh, topic with a tad of tongue in the cheek because it plays on a quote from a 1961 Soviet reader in medieval history. Easy and tempting, it is of course by no means my intention to criticize that edition with the benefit of hindsight. For its time, the pre-digital era of the Iron Curtain, the book met all uh, requirements of an up-to-date uh, state of the historical art. Uh, my talk today rather touches on, first, some gullible reproductions of some commonplaces in historical research, despite the recent advancement in source criticism, and second, the far-reaching conclusions sometimes drawn therefrom. Um, I will try answering two questions. One, what is a thrimsa in the Anglo-Saxon monetary system? And here I have to uh, also make a little disclaimer that I'm going to say thrimsa because this is how it's usually spelled in modern research. But if we are being pedantic, it should be thrimsa, not a thrimsa. But who cares? And two, why does it deserve our attention to begin with? In this system, thrimsa appears an anomaly. Other units of money and accounting, such as the penny, shilling, mancus, aura, mark, and pound, and their ratios, come up multiple uh, times in the sources. But in the three million word Old English corpus, Thrimsa comes up only in a handful of contradictory times. All we can be relatively sure of is the word's etymology, derived from the Latin name of a late imper imperial golden coin valued at a third of a solidus, namely the Tremisis. According to Philip Grierson interpretation, however, such coins, known in England uh, from the late 6th to the late 7th century, were called shillings in the Kentish laws. After the pan-European transition to silver at the close of the 7th century, limited circulation of Tremisis, of both local and foreign mint, and whatever actual name, ceases for good. As for the rest, the nature and orthography of the Anglo-Saxon Thrimsa are extremely vague. The earlier Epinal Erfurt glossary uses Thrimsa as the lemma for us. Uh, the full phrase, however, makes little grammatical or lexical sense and therefore helps little to elucidate the sort for meaning. At first glance, the slightly later Leiden glossary sheds more light, but even its explanation leaves room for equating the Thrimsas, three the Thrimsas, with one solidus or the other way around. The editor of the source, Jan Hestels, allowed for both, while still leaning to the first ratio. On two other occasions, the lighting glossary insists on the parity of three argentei to a solidus, argentei here standing just for a denarius or a common penny. Uh, assuming textual unity throughout the whole glossary, this would make the thrimsa either a unit of nine argentei or itself a synonym to the argenteus, but etymology suffers either way. Furthermore, we read in the same source that three solidi make up a starter. This would make Thrimsa either a one-ninth of a starter or itself a synonym of a starter. Most of Thrimsa's occurrences belong to the Old English translation of the Botanic, Botanic Medical Treatise uh, Herbarium of Pseudo Apuleius from the 4th century. Um, in it, Thrimsa translates drachma here used as a unit of weight for measuring ingredients in the recipes. Though, as you can see on this slide, the exact equivalents aren't consistent. Modern critics are cautious and not unanimous on the date of the source. Its latest editor, Hubert van der Friend, hypothesized that it could have originated in Northumbria during its cultural he hegemony in the 8th century, but there remains room for a further elaboration, and all three extant manuscripts are no older than the 11th century. 
Finally, Thrymsa appears in the Old English glosses to the famous Lindisfarne Gospels. The glosses are dated to roughly the year 970. In the Miracle of the Starter, um, the glossator by the name of Aldred translated the Latin original as for Thrymsas. The context leaves little doubt that in the single mention throughout all of the New Testament, Starter stands for a tetradrachma, that is, for dragmai. Uh, how these figures are supposed to match these from the Leiden glossary is unclear, but perhaps Eldred wasn't the first one. Two old High German glossaries from the 8th century also translate Drachma as Dremisa or something similar, but like the Lindisfarne source, these glossaries were written off the biblical material, so how much of an independent source they are is, well, questionable. All things considered, these data hardly represent specimens of consonants, which leaves us to assume that Anglo-Saxon translators did not strive for uniformity. uniformity. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll avoid enumerating all such inconsistencies and will allow you to, familiar to familiarize yourselves uh, with them on the slide that you are seeing right now. It is an unexpected but vain hope that people in traditional pre-industrial societies would possess some encyclopedic precision in technical terms, especially marginal ones. This slide demonstrates the acknowledgement of this ambiguity already by the contemporaries themselves. Modern numismatists normally and justifiably limit themselves to just stating this ambiguity surrounding the Thrymsa. My own conclusions are two. First, the very early borrowing of Thrymesis never took good hold in the English language, possibly due to the quick seize of use of uh, golden coins, so-called. But even during their circulation, however, to judge from the polyphony of the extant sources and Grierson arguments, they passed under a different name. Therefore, second, it would probably not stretch the evidence to assume that by the late 10th century, Thrymsa hardly was a living monitor term in everyday parlance, and was only sporadically used to convey a somewhat amorphous sense of antiquity and exotica. This is where we could end the meeting today. Thank you very much and goodbye. Admittedly, in many cases, money and associated vocabulary merit a generalized understanding, not least in biblical examples aimed at the symbolic meaning and whose practical realities likely exceeded the translator's familiarity with them. Attempts at building self-consistent systems on such at times shaky basis by juggling various weight ratios, monetary denominations and terms, thus warrants, well, a certain caution. Yet this is exactly what happened to Thrymsa, just which justified my talk today. Thrymsa's last appearance occurs in one text that is today conventionally called uh, Noflea de Laha, or the laws of the northern people, presumably the Northumbrians. It is the um, comment to this source that my title today plays on. The, re the relevant section contains a schedule of Virgos estimated in Thrymsas. The numbers are given as follows, 30,000 for a king, 15 for archbishop or atheling, 8,000 for bishops and eldermen, four for a king's high reeve and uh, some vague hold, and 2,000 for a thane of, a, of the mass, that is to say a priest, and a lay thane. And finally, 266 thrimses or 200 mercian shillings for a churl. I should mention that it is only this source that spells thrimsa with... Um, sorry, someone, someone just dropped out. Did, no? Excuse me. Um, I should mention that it is only this source that spells Thrymsa with a TH combination. I'm going to return to this slightly later on. Two of these figures took a particularly firm root in subsequent historiography, the life values of the churl and thane. Churls get multiple mentions in Anglo-Saxon, or actually, to be exact, almost exclusively West Saxon legal, uh, legal tradition. Um, there is little doubt that on the lexical level, the West Saxon churl was synonymous with the legal category of tuihunde, that is to say, a person with a 200 shilling wergild. On the other end of the spectrum, we meet the 1200, or people with a 1200 shilling wergild. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to call it the West Saxon nobility. 
This group is too attested in the earliest West Saxon legislation and on, as are Thanes, first and foremost, King's Thanes. However, they appear much more a functional rather than a status group. They are King's servants, his vassals, if this is not too anachronistic a term. That being said, for reasons that I'll have to withhold in the interest of time now, it appears that by the very end of the Anglo-Saxon period, the word, and I emphasize word, Thane, had acquired an additional broader meaning aristocrat in general. However, unlike the churls, nowhere in the pre-Norman text are Thanes equated with the 1200ers. The only case of the opposite is in a text that is closely associated with the Nothlea de Laha, on which I'll speak later. Now, please keep a, spect a skeptical eye on the logic that follows. In Mercia, a shilling was worth four pence, but five in Wessex. When these figures are collated against those in the Nothlea de Laha, it follows that 2,000 thrimses are equal to 6,000 pence, which renders exactly 1,200 West Saxon shillings. This in turn transform, transforms Thanes from a privileged club of primarily king's few vassals into a broad and legally defined class, just like churls. This would expand our understanding of the Anglo-Saxon society a lot. And you can see some applications quoted on the slide. Uh, some facts more, may call for our caution, however. I'll talk about it in a greater detail in a bit, but here I'll just point out only one fact. The Twihunde and the Twelfthunde are known only from West Saxon sources, whereas Thrimse poses to be an allegedly Northumbrian money, rendered in Mercian shillings, by the way. I'd like to avoid over-criticism, yet I'm not sold on this. As established by Dorothy Bethorum back in 1950, the North Lera Laha is one of the five elements in the so-called compilation on status by York, the York Archbishop Woolston. He was one of the leading intellectuals of his time, and one of his favorite ideologies, or as I call it, brain children, was what Patrick Worm Wormald aptly called orderly or holy society. It is exactly this topic that the compilation addresses. Only two manuscripts have preserved the Old English original of the North Lea de Laha. Uh, they were later recycled in England, Norman Lat Latin renditions and Lawrence Nowell's reverse translation. One is uh, Corpus Christi College Manuscript 201. The other is the famous text of Serafensis. The text in them varies a bit, and the very compound North Leoda, North Leoda or the Northern people, occurs only in the Cambridge version. In it, the North Laoda Laha is followed by the third element of the compilation, the Mirkna Laha, or that is to say, Mercian law. This is the very exception that I mentioned earlier. It is only here that we read for the first and only time before 1066, black and white, that, I quote, according to the law of the Mercians, a commoner's Weigeld is 200 shillings, the Weigeld of a Thane is six times as much, that is 1200 shillings. The text then ascertains us that the king's Weigeld is six times as much, which is equal to 30,000 sheatas. The later word is, well, all things considered, an archaic synonym for the penny, although I should disclaim that there are many problems around it. For the purposes of this presentation, I side with Dr. Andrew Rabin, one of the leading experts on Wollstone, in my opinion, in that all elements in the compilation are integral parts of a bigger one. This is also why I do not hold Mirkna Laha for an independent evidence of the Thainli Wergild. Paragraph 7 to 13 in the North Laird Laha pose the least of problems. They lay out the provisos for how a churl can secure a nobleman's Wergild. Stylistically, this part is unmistakably, uh, unmistakably Wollstone's. And in Lexis and Contents, it recycles King Ina's laws. Thrimses are mentioned in the first six paragraphs, however, which I believe to represent some genuine tradition, or as it is sometimes called, the Northumbrian core. Paragraph six looks a bit odd with its clunky 266 Thrimses. Dorothy Bethorum believed that this clause belongs to the so-called core, but I agree with Dr. Rabin that this is Wilson's attempt to connect the North Laoda Laha with the Mirkna Laha. 
This connection is reinforced through a number of peculiar coincidences in the two texts. The mainstream dating of the supposed core would put it bit, roughly between um, the 860s and 954. This is the opinion of, for example, the late Patrick Wormald and John Hudson. Andrew Rabin is more cautious and does not provide concrete dates, but he too denies, or as far as I understand, he at least was denying it, uh, Wilson's authorship. Excuse me, I'll just take a sip. I will allow myself some audacity. Oops, sorry. Excuse me, this is not, yeah. I will allow myself some audacity and disagree with my senior colleagues. There's a number of counter arguments to the suggested dating. For instance, the King's High Reeve is mentioned most frequently at the turn of the millennia, and most importantly, as a subject ruler of uh, the non-sovereign Northumbrian polity, principality, however you would like to call it. The absence of independent kingship in Northumbria after the year 954 is itself not a proof that the King's Weigel could not be mentioned. Why not? You could just simply write about it. Why should you? Why should you not, that is? Uh, the text orthography and spelling match the late West Saxon dialect and not, for example, the spellings in the Lindisfarne Gospels. One could argue that this is only the language of the extant copies. Yet the Textus Rafensis is known to have preserved very archaic Kentish spellings from the 7th century, but its version of the Nothleda Laha reveals the same spellings as in the Cambridge manuscript, rather than presupposing some lost Anglian prototype which was independently mended by two scribes to such a degree that no Anglian trace was left, it is only logical to assume that the archetype was West Saxon from the start. Most of all, I cannot agree that the supposed Northumbrian core reveals no, as I call them, Wolsonianisms, uh, or hallmarks of Wilson's pen. It is true that the rhythm and syntax are not his, but the vocabulary and general message very much are, as you can see on this slide. Allowing for Wilson's additions to the supposed core leads one to ask what exactly is Northumbrian in this text, if all of its ideas are by the archbishops, uh, the archbishop, is it the Thrimsa? If my unorthodox interpretation is correct, then this postulated Northumbrian core is merely a phantom, and all 13 paragraphs were written by Wollstone himself. This returns us back to where I started. What did he mean? with a trimsa, thrimsa, and why did he use it in the first place? As I said before, one of Wollstone's edifix was an orderly society, since only it will receive Christian salvation. In a recent study of Wollstone's recycling of the 7th century Kentish legal corpus, Dr. Rabin concluded that it could have, I quote, initially functioned for Wollstone as a source of moral and legal precedent upon which he could draw in the course of his emerging project of social regeneration, end quote. And it furthermore, I quote again, enabled Wollstone uh, to ground what may have appeared as legislative innovation in the legal traditions of the conversion era, end quote. A similar repetition of other 7th century material visibly stands out in the second half of the North Leo de Laha as well. Indeed, this would not be the first time Wollstone resorted to a historical legal fiction to present his vision as rooted in an old tradition, as is evidenced by his laws of Edward and uh, Edward the Elder and Guthrum. Um, and actually, I thank Jake for pointing this out to me. It was his observation here. Uh, the supposed Mercian and Northumbrian laws could be seen as part of the same program. You might recall that I drew the attention to the odd fact that the equivalence of the de facto Thainley aristocracy to the 1200 West Saxon nobility occurs in a formerly non-West Saxon laws. This very quotation equation, I argue, is the hallmark of Wilson's obsession with regularity. But then he presents the allegedly local norms as surprisingly, and quote unquote, surprisingly, consonant with the West Saxon ones, which he himself sought to tidy up in King Canute's legislation. And moreover, he presents them as very archaic. Bearing in mind that Thrimsa likely was a vague term for some ancient money in general, and perhaps even in Northumbrianism, if we believe the Lindisfarne Gospels, we start understanding how it got into the North Laha. 
Choosing this archaism instead of the more familiar shilling was hardly uh, reflecting any monetary practice in the region. Why is Wollstone operating in the Mirknallah with shillings and not thrimses? I believe because the shilling was indeed the local currency. Yet if Thank you. I, I'll, I'll try to, to make it. Uh, yet even here, he, they, the shillings, are counted not in the conventional pennies, but the archaic shiatas. It would appear that the symbolism of the numbers was more important than the actual monetary contents. For instance, if we use the arithmetic in the Nathlerlah itself, the King's Weigel should be 28,800 28, shiatas, but Wollstone writes 30,000. Why? Because 28,800 isn't neat. Plus, it has no precedent, but 30,000 have. In the Nofleya de Laha, he chose Thrimse. Apparently, he conflated the etymology of the word with the, English, with the old English numeral, three, which is also reflected in the spelling. You remember that I pointed it out. Because the order uh, is in Wessex, Wilson converts the Weigelt at such a rate as to get the required 6,000 pence like in Wessex. Once again, this is much more about symbolism than actual money. Why is Wollstone converting the Thrimses into the, the Mercian shillings and not West Saxon? Well, simply because the following section of the compilation on the status was the Mirknalaha and not, shall we say, West Saxonalaha. I began with a purely lexical inquiry. I'm wrapping it up. Uh, I believe that the Thrimse was never not just a coin as the Soviet commentators uh, bona fide believed, but it was never a monetary unit to begin with. And this is actually not something that numinous, numinous, numismatists have not observed. Wurgels were never counted in the thrimses. This early borrowing could have maintained only a marginal status had it not been utilized by Wilson in his ideological scheme. This scheme, uh, why this scheme enjoys such a wide circulation in modern scholarship, I believe, this has to do with the research agenda of the 19th century when this authorship wasn't known while the text was seemingly easy. I believe that this text is Wollstone's wishful thinking and his handling of the Thrimsa is yet another proof thereof. This thesis further lends support to Dr. Rabin's claim to the limited value of the compilation on status as a prima facie source. It disguises itself as a legal text, but in reality it is only one man's pure ideology. Its claims are not supported by any other pre-Norman source whatsoever, and in the light of the presented evidence, when construing the socio-historical narratives, I believe medievalists could probably consider discontinuing treating the Thrimse as an otherwise unattested unit of accounting wurgels in particular, and the compilation on status at face value in general. If anything, I, I end here, neither seems to relate to the famous Rankian dictum vs eigentlich gewesen war. And with that, I thank you very much, and I will probably allow me 30 seconds to say I began stating that I'm Russian, and I right now am very much traumatized by what is going on. I would like to send this message to all my colleagues and friends that we in Russia condemn this war, we condemn the, the violence, we are standing with the Ukrainian people, and we are imploring you to try to keep some open space and open place in your hearts for us who are still opposing this war and just want to be a normal normal part of the world and of the academic community and just just live a normal life as i usually say there are 42 million people that are now being attacked by one madman with a nuke but there are also 142 million people that are now being held collective hostages thank you so much